Hello, everyone, and good evening to you. Thanks for joining us today on this wonderful occasion where we are considering this great subject, Why Jesus? You know, people are joining us from all over the world. Special thanks to people joining us from Ghana, Nigeria, and Israel. But also, I want to welcome all our special guests, those who have been invited to the various Zoom events we are having in the London area. Just to let you know that this event has been organized by the London Area Apostolic Churches in collaboration with the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. Later during the program, I'll be uh, connecting you to the people who will be in the panel as we consider some critical questions around the subject of Jesus. We have Brother Simon Edwards of the OCA team, 
Also, we have Pastor Victor Jibuke of the All Nation Center and myself, Pastor Edwin Bajumo. But before we start, because I'm gonna get the choir to sing, let us pray. Father God in heaven, we just thank you and bless your name. We say, receive all glory, honor, and adoration. Father, we have come to know more about you. And our prayer tonight is that we will know more about Jesus Christ. Father God, I pray that as many will listen and watch, that God, you will speak to them. We thank you for the panelists, the one who will speak, praying that your grace and your hand will be upon them. And today, Lord, there shall be greater rejoicing in heaven. So before we start, before I get um, Brother Simon Edwards to speak, please let's listen to the choir sing. Amen. Testify, Lord. We will testify. 
Thank you very much, choir. Thank you for that song. God does indeed. He's an amazing God. And so what I'm going to do now, I'm going just to hand over to Simon Edwards, just to give us a summary of his thoughts around the whole subject of why Jesus, before we go into the question and answer sessions. please. Thank you, Simon. Well, thank you, Pastor Edwin. And uh, Hello to everyone uh, to whom this is being streamed into your houses. Um, so we're going to have a quick uh, summary of thinking about why would anyone think about investigating who Jesus is or considering who Jesus is for them? How could somebody who lived 2,000 years ago have anything to say today that would be relevant? How could Jesus be relevant to your life? Well, I think the first thing I'd say if thinking about what, why would anyone investigate or consider Jesus is this. Over 2 million people around the world self-identify as his followers. You can't say that about any other person. Jesus has more followers alive today than anyone. Such a person is worthy of consideration. Secondly, Jesus has made the biggest historical impact of anyone. There's different metrics we can use to, to, to measure that. You can look at Google Analytics to see his influence. You can look at uh, Time Magazine a few years ago, assembled a group of experts to ask who's left the biggest historical impact on our planet. And the answer was Jesus of Nazareth has left the biggest historical footprint of anyone. He's a real person. He really lived. Historians say to deny that Jesus was a real person is the intellectual equivalent of denying the moon landing. He really, really existed. He's the most famous person the left the biggest impact of anyone who's ever lived for that reason alone. Forget anything else. He is worth investigating. He's worth considering. How could one person make such a huge impact on our world such that so many people would follow him today? I'd say the second reason you, would, you should investigate and seriously consider the relevance of Jesus today is his words, the things that he said. Many people today, even people from other religions, even atheists, regard the teaching of Jesus Christ as the greatest teaching that has ever been uttered from the lips of a human being. Whether it's Gandhi or Albert Einstein or the atheist John Mortimer, people recognize that Jesus spoke words that have made a difference on our planet. If you were to ask people, do you think Every single person has dignity and value and should be respected. Well, if you were to ask that question to people across human history, the most common answer would have been no. Even today, there are many parts of the world where there is not a, an accepted idea that every single person has human value. The reason that many countries today and many people just instinctively understand that every person has dignity and value and should be respected, it's primarily because of the influence of the Bible and the teachings of Jesus Christ. This earth-shattering shatter, teaching that we should love our neighbor, and not only that, that we should love our enemy. It's because of these sort of words, even philosophers have recognized that the world today is a much better place than what it would otherwise be because of the influence of Jesus' words on our planet. Yet another reason you should consider the relevance of Jesus for your life is the absolutely unique claim he makes. No other religious leader, no other major religious leader made the sort of claims that Jesus made. Some people said, listen to my, uh, listen, listen to me, I'll show you the way to go. Jesus said, I am the way. Some people say, said, some, le some religious leaders said, listen to me, I'm telling you the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. 
some religious religious leaders said, if you do what I tell you to do, you will experience fullness of life. Jesus said, I am the life. Some religious leaders said, listen to my words. They will change the world. Jesus said, by my words, I created the world. Now, for someone to claim that they are God, as C.S. Lewis rightly pointed out, there's only three possible logical um, options that are on the table. One, the person is a complete lunatic. They're crazy. They have God delusions. Number two, they're trying to con you. There's some sort of religious con man trying to get your money or your allegiance or something like that. He's a liar. Or number three, he's really telling the truth. He's Lord. Liar, lunatic, or Lord, those are your three options. And when you think about Jesus, clearly he's not a lunatic. He spoke the greatest words of any person who's ever lived. And how could you say he's a liar when so many people trusted him, people who lived with him over three years and saw, saw him in action morning, evening, and night? They lived with him and traveled with him 24-7, even when he was on trial with, before Pontius Pilate. Pilate recognized he was an innocent man. And even when he was being tortured and crucified on a cross for you and me the words that came out of his lips were father forgive them they don't know what they're doing a con man could not keep up that pretense and certainly wouldn't when they're being tortured on a cross they have nothing to gain from it the other reason we can be so confident that jesus really was lord is because of his resurrection that he rose from the dead now a lot of people say how could you possibly believe that somebody rose from the dead. You're talking about something that happened 2000 years ago, and there's absolutely no evidence for it. Well, actually, if you're willing to seriously investigate the evidence, the historical case for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is overwhelmingly strong. So strong that someone like Oxford philosopher Richard Swinburne could write a book in which they look at the evidence for Jesus's resurrection and apply philosophers and mathematical mathematicians tools of analysis to ask the question what is the probability that Jesus rose from the dead based on the evidence and Richard Swinburne in his book the resurrection of God incarnate says it's 97 percent probable that he rose from the dead in other words overwhelmingly probable to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And that's in a book published by Oxford University Press, which means it's peer reviewed at the highest levels of academia. Scholar N.T. Wright says he's examined all the, all the um, different explanations for the facts surrounding Jesus Christ and says far and away, the best explanation is that Jesus really did rise from the dead. And even a, a skeptical scholar like Geza Vermez says, after 2000 years of historical inquiry, there are no alternative explanations that make sense of the fact that the disciples sincerely believed that Jesus rose from the dead, that the early church just exploded in numbers soon after Jesus's death, and that these people were willing to change their monotheistic worldviews as Jews to embrace this idea of the son of God. There's no explanations he says, as a skeptic, as an atheist, except for the Christian explanation that Jesus really did rise from the dead. It's the only explanation that makes sense of the facts. And you just think about it. The hi historians say that Jesus's followers genuinely believed that he rose from the dead. That's This is like Oxford University, university historians across the world, they say, Jesus' disciples really believed it. They really believed it. And the reason they say that is because it wouldn't have made any sense for them to be lying about it. Why? Because nothing proves sincerity like martyrdom. And Jesus' disciples had absolutely nothing to gain by saying that he rose from the dead and everything to, if, if they knew that it was a lie. If they knew that it was a lie, and, and they knew that Jesus didn't really appear to them, they would have had nothing to gain by keeping that lie going. Because as you know, they were persecuted for their belief in Jesus' lordship and resurrection. They were persecuted. They were executed. They were tortured. They were rounded up and thrown to the lions. They had everything to lose, reputation, family, career, 
livelihood, safety, bodily health. And yet they risked their lives to spread this message that Jesus had really appeared to them. They'd seen it with their own eyes. They touched him with their own hands. He'd really risen from the dead. If you're willing to investigate the evidence for Jesus's resurrection, there's plenty of evidence there and it is overwhelming. So there's just a number of reasons why you should investigate Jesus and take him seriously. His historical impact, his amazing words, his incredible and unique claims, and the historical evidence for his resurrection. But I want to leave you with this final thought. The main reason I would say that you would not only investigate who Jesus is for yourself, but ultimately entrust your life to him is because he's God. He is God come in human flesh. And we would only trust someone that we know is true, really exists, and we, that we know is good, really good. And we know that Jesus as the son of God is both of these things. We know that who he is as a son of God through the historical evidence, his words, and just pick up a Bible and read it if you've never read it to see who Jesus really, really was. But secondly, we know he's really, really good and his heart for us is good. How do we know that? Well, let me finish with this story. When the Russian novelist Dostoevsky was staring at a painting of Jesus's body, he was struck by this truth that no other God has scars. No other God has scars. The Christian message is absolutely unique. God did not stay up high, but loving us so much, he came down low. He willingly chose to enter into our world as a human being, into our world of dirt and sweat and tears and suffering and pain and rejection and humiliation and shame. And Jesus Christ chose to take all our shame and all our guilt on his shoulders on the cross and bear the penalty and the weight of your sin and my sin on his shoulders. And then as he died to bury that in the grave so that it need bother us no more. And then he rose from the dead, defeating death and making the way for every single one of us to be restored to relationship with God. And essentially, Christianity is an invitation. It is an invitation from God through Jesus Christ to you, inviting you to come home, to put your hand in the hand of Jesus Christ, a hand which one day, if you're able to look at it, you will see is a scarred, nail scarred hand. That is a hand and that is a person in whom you can put your trust. And our, our plea to you, our encouragement to every person listening on this call would be put your hand in the hand of Jesus Christ. He made you. He loves you. He wants you to know life in all its fullness and freedom in all its beauty. True freedom, not the freedom to do whatever you want, however you want to, whenever you want, but the freedom to live as he created you to live. A life of love and adventure hand in hand with him. So put your hand in his hand and trust him. That is our message for today. We're going to open it up for some time of question and answer as the host explains in just a moment. Thank you for giving me your time. Thank you very much, Simon, for that. <clears throat> very clear, very well uh, articulated. The key thing for me was the invitation uh, from God that through Jesus Christ, we can come home. What warm, welcoming words. Now, as Simon has said, we're now going to open for questions and answer session. Uh, we've got questions coming in and let me open straight away uh, with the first question. And apologies again, just for me to mention that Simon is on our panel. We've also got Pastor Victor Jibuke as well, one of the pastors in the All Nation Center Apostolic Church. We've also got Pastor Edwin as well, who is our host tonight, who is also on our panel. So welcome panelists and uh, ready for the questions. The first question that I have, uh, just to pose, I mean, let's start with your good self, Simon. Uh, and the first question is this. Many people agree that Jesus existed, 
but question his deity. Is he God? How should Christians respond to this question? Is Jesus God? Over to you, Simon. <laughs> well, thank you. I think that's a really excellent question to, to start off with. Um, no one but God could have predicted that they would, write, would, would be killed and three days later rise from the dead. If you read the account of Jesus Christ, you, you will see that one of the things that happened to Jesus as he suffered and bled on the cross for you and me, at the end, the soldiers put a spear into his side and blood and water flowed. Now, the, the, at, at that time, they didn't have the modern medical knowledge that we do today. But today, a, a, tra a trained doctor can, look, can read that passage and realize that the presence of blood and water flowing from Jesus' side was clearly evident of the fact that Jesus had died. The reason being that the blood and the water would have been indicative of pericardial and pleural fluid that would have built up around the membranes of the heart and the lungs, which itself would have been a cause of severe blood loss and dehydration, which we know Jesus suffered the blood loss through the many uh, 39 times with the cat of nine tails whip, the lacerations and being hung in a Mediterranean sun. So historians do not doubt that Jesus died on the cross. The evidence that he rose again from the dead three days later is just overwhelming. You couple that evidence with the fact that millions of people throughout history have claimed to have experienced the divine influence of Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit on their lives, the complete transformation. I mean, I, I'm sure there are many people on this call like me who've met people who've, who themselves have experienced meeting the risen Lord Jesus, and it has been a complete game changer. We've seen people on drug addictions, completely turned around, alcohol addictions completely turned around, um, wife beaters, uh, cr criminals, uh, people who were just completely selfish and out for themselves who've met Jesus and even their spouses have, seen, have said they have changed. You, you, can't, you can't have so many testimonies of so many people having met Jesus like that and then not to be something behind it. So really... It's the accumulation of these many, these many evidences all together that point to who Jesus is. And lastly, I would say, if you read the Bible, you encounter, as many people have encountered the risen Lord Jesus in the pages of the Bible, they see that this, it's, they, they start off reading the book and then at the end they realize the book is reading them and it is explaining them. And it is explaining the deepest desires of their hearts and making sense of life in a way that life has never been made sense of before. So in these many ways, we see that uh, this is pointing to the fact that Jesus could not have been just any old clever man, that he really was the Lord. So there's some things to sort of start us off, but there's more things that could be said. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Simon. Uh, I think that was concisely answered, so I'm not going to refer that to the other panelists. Let me open with the question number two, and I'll ask this to uh, Pastor Victor. And question number two is this, with all the available facts, and again, Simon has articulated them so clearly, with all the available facts, why are people still doubting the validity of Jesus in our days? Very good question. Um, I think there are a number of reasons for this. I would say the, 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 the society we live in is a society that puts science and the, if you like, the things, the physical things that we can see, puts it um, and, and puts it, if you like, at a, a forefront and says, well, look, this is if you like the evidence that you don't need religion or you don't need um, God. Uh, uh, science explains everything that you need to know. And so you don't need anything else. And I think people take that on and rely on that kind of message and therefore do not need or do not feel the need to investigate 
the claims of Christianity, the claims of Jesus, as Simon have been talking about, we investigate the Bible. It is this world where science and, if you like, scientific inquiry is, is, is if you like, put forward as the basis of all facts, all, all questions of life. You need not um, find any more questions anywhere else. And I think that's, the, that's one of the key things. Um, because as Simon says, if anyone bothers to investigate the claims of Christianity and realizes the weight of what is there in terms of what Christ says about himself and in terms of what uh, the evidence says and the lives of over a billion people that have been dramatically changed by Jesus, there is no question that people will put their faith in Christ. Now, there is another issue and and obviously that's one that the bible talks about um that there is um a, a spiritual angle to this there is a, a spirit of the age there is a, a supernatural angle which i guess it's easy it's very difficult for people to understand because it's in the spiritual realm but there is um a dark uh, spiritual angle or a spiritual power that the bible talks about the devil and his agents and when we read the Bible, we recognize that there is that angle where the devil and his angels seek to, um, if you like, blind. That's the word that's used in the Bible, blind the minds and the hearts of people so that they don't realize this life that God offers them, this world beyond the physical that God offers them so that they can know truly what is available to them in Christ. And that's a major, that's a very very important thing to think about. So yes, I would say the two key things, and there are other things, I guess, but the two key things is number one, the, the fact that people have come to be told and believe that all there is, is what is physical, what they can see, what they can touch. And science has explained everything there is to explain about life. There is nothing further that Christ or Christianity can explain or give them. And then the second reason I think, as I said, is the supernatural which is to do with the devil and he, the powers that are under him, where they have obviously began to influence people against the knowledge of Christ and against the knowledge of God, which is one of the main reasons why people are not able to trust in what is clearly what God, what clearly God is offering them in Christ. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Victor. Pastor Edwin, let me just again still delve into this science aspect, because again, this is one of the things that Christians who engage with uh, non-believers come across as answers that is always put out there, I don't know, defensively or again, in terms of misinformation. And the question is this again on that topic of science. Science has proven that religion is a myth. Science contradicts the Bible. So why should I believe in Jesus? Again, a common uh, throughout there from those that we try and evangelize to or try and share the word with. So how do we go about, again, trying to give a concise, if possible, answer to that? Science has proven that religion is a myth. Science contradicts the Bible. So why should I believe in Jesus? What's your answer, Pastor Edwin? Um, thank you for that question. I think one of the things I've come to realize is that um, people assume that science disproves the existence of God and Christianity. And, and I don't think so because there are scientists who, who have studied and looked at the facts available and came up with the understanding that there is something to this world. So take for example, there are scholastic science who believe in intelligent design because they see, they see the world, how everything seems to be in its rightful place. And there's a belief that no, this cannot be the big bang. This has come from as somebody who has taught carefully about building and designing the world. And so they frame it as intelligent design. But when we when, when we come to engage people around science and Christianity, it's about facts. We start to give them facts of what Christ has done, what the Bible says, and going through that logical, that's why we have apologetics, where we can logically give reason for the reason for our faith. And we can defend our faith with logic, with common sense questions. And I start to ask people, look, look at, look at the human body frame. What makes it so unique? Do you think this is evolution? And then when we start to ask those questions, you see that people who are even using science to challenge Christianity will back down. I, I, I was opportunity to speak to somebody 
a very intelligent young man at work and who studied all these things and he came and we came to this point he said he has problem with us christians that we always talk about faith that we have to believe then i said you're right but also you two have to believe that there is no god that this world was not made and so whichever way either you have faith to believe god does not exist or you have faith to believe that god exists and that became an eye opener for him because Yes, he cannot disprove the fact that God does not exist. Neither can he say, okay, God exists. But having faith is key to all these things. And this is where science, who needs everything to be experimented, everything to be explained, has problem. Because sometimes when it comes to the Christian work, it's about faith, believing the facts in the Bible, and believing that, yes, what God said he did, he did it, that Jesus came, he died and he rose. And so that's where we believe as Christians. That's what we believe as Christians. And that is what we will challenge people about. And finally, let me just add this. I've always said to people when we have this argument about faith and, and death and resurrection of Jesus, I said, can you stake your future on not believing that there is a God? If you can, fine. But for me, I have staked my future knowing that God exists, looking at all the facts, looking at what the Bible says, and exercising my faith in what the Bible says. I believe God exists. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Pastor Edwin. Uh, again, I make no apologies. The questions are getting a bit harder. Now, to your good self, Simon, I ask this question uh, that has just come in. Religion is the cause of a lot of misery in the world today. The rich are getting richer. The poor are getting poorer. Now, believing in Jesus, how does this bring about a balance? Again, that's obviously from a viewpoint of somebody who is looking at the here and now, not really focused on eternity. So they're saying, I see that religion is uh, the cause of a lot of misery. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. How does believing in Jesus bring about an equality, a balance? Simon. Thank you. Yeah, the question the questions are definitely getting getting hard. Um, so I would I would um, ask the, the the questioner to consider: Do you think the world would actually be a nicer and a friendlier place if no one believed in God? If no one believed that there is someone on high who actually cares about how you live your life? If you can do it if would the world be a better place if if death is the end and it's the same end result for hitler as it is for mother teresa and people knew that would the world be a better place would the world be a better place if jesus had never existed and had never taught these world changing words to love your neighbor love not just tolerate but but positively love your neighbor and even your enemy would the world be a better place if jesus had never taught and the influence of this teaching had never gone across that we should forgive those who sin against us would the world be a better place if that if that was the case i think the world would be a, a much worse place without the words of jesus christ i also think the world would be a much worse place if everyone believed that, that in the end there is no judgment for the way we live in fact I think it was um, it was the Polish poet observing all that happened in the that happened in the anti-god government regimes of communist Russia and of China and of Cambodia, who observed that the opium of the masses is not religion; it's the belief that in the end there will be no judgment for the way we live our lives. That, he said, has been the cause of more pain and heartache in our world than anything. Our lives, if there is no God, well, how, how easily as human beings we revert to God. Well, how, how easily as human beings we revert to survival of the fittest, like the, like the animal kingdom, red, red in tooth and claw, the strong dominates the weak. The, 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 the bigger dominates the smaller, and that's just the way that it is. And Frederick Nietzsche, the philosopher, said, well, there is no God. 
he believed there was no God. And what did he conclude if there's no God? It meant that there's no up, no down, no left or right, no good, no evil. If there is no God, there is no objective moral law giver and hence, and hence no objective moral law and hence no right or wrong and hence no reason why anyone should not just try to dominate. If you're rich, why not get richer off the back of the poor? There's, there's no one telling you otherwise. Survival of the fittest. So I, I think the world would be a much worse place if without belief in God. And I think the world would be a much worse place without the influence of Christ's teaching. And the whole idea actually that religion is the cause of much violence in the world. You, you, people think if you get rid of religion, suddenly the world would be a peaceful place. That's just a bunch of rubbish. I mean, it's the same as saying, has religion caused wars? Yes, but not, not as many as you think it has. Ha has money caused wars? Yes. Has politics caused wars? Yes. Has, has science been used for in war? Yes. So should we get rid of money? Should we get rid of politics? Should we get rid of science? Should we get rid of religion? No, the central problem is not, it's not religion, it's not science, it's not politics, it's not money. The central problem is you and me. It's the human heart. The line between good and evil runs between every human heart, as has been well said. And actually what we really need is a cure for the selfishness and sin of the human heart. Exactly. And that is very much what Jesus offers, a cure for the selfishness that is the root cause of all the pain that the questioner is talking about, including the exploitative practices of the rich and the poor. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Simon. Uh, Pastor Victor, can you add to that? <clears throat> I think it's one of the one of um, a, one of a, a major issue that comes up all the time when you talk to non-believers. It's this question about reconciling suffering and um, you know a, a God and and so on. And I think it was Sigmund Freud that said that um, you know he, he couldn't match the a good God uh, with um, the evil and the suffering that is in the world. Um, and, and that is the case. And to be honest, when I see God, that's the first thing I'll be asking. What is, why did you allow all of the evil uh, that has happened, the, the things that have happened to my friends, my loved ones in my own life, why did you let them happen? And that is, so that is a, um, a, um, a real and, and a, a something that affects us all. And that makes us all think. But what I wanted to add to what Simon has really um, comprehensively said there is is the fact that whatever you think the fact is that when you think about Jesus and look at his life and look at the way that people's suffering touched him and looked at the way that he himself suffered and the Bible said that because he suffered like we are he is able to bear with our suffering so this is not a God that is detached from suffering in the world. This is a God that is very present, which I'm very aware. It says that he very much aware and impacted by suffering because he went through suffering. Remember Simon said he was beaten, he was start, he was, he was um, you know, he was nailed on the cross of Calvary. And so he knew very much what suffering is about, the way we feel it. And he was tempted and, and so on. So um, what, what I will say to, to someone who is in that situation and grappling with this subject of um, the suffering that's in the world and God is that God does understand and he is with us in that suffering and he does not want anyone to suffer. Yes, because of people's free will and because of people's power to choose evil or good, there is a lot of suffering in the world because people have chosen to do evil and to do wrong rather than to do good. You can't blame God for that. But you can certainly say to people that if you knew God, if you knew Jesus, and if you knew just how much he cared about everyone's life, about every individual, as Simon was saying earlier on, the fact that the value and the worth of every human being, if you knew how God loved everyone, you would choose uh, to do good to everyone. You would choose a world where we would all um, be good to each other and you would choose to do right. So 
the, these are very difficult issues to grapple with. But my only addition to that is that God understands suffering and he does not want the suffering that goes on. in it. That is not his will. That is not his wish. And he is with us. And if you are suffering or you are feeling you're in a bad place and you're asking the question, where is God? I want to tell you now that God is with you in that. And if you reach out to him, he can touch you he can comfort you he can bring you through and go walk right through that situation with you and i'm just asking reach out to him and just test it just say you know even if you're skeptic that um, you're skeptic about it just say lord i am suffering there are a lot of suffering around me what do you have to say about it and i guarantee you that you will know that god will respond to you because he said ask and you will receive amen Thank you very much for that, Pastor Victor. Pastor Edwin, let me bring you in on another question. Uh, and the question is this, in our postmodern world, how can Christians lay claim to the fact that Jesus is the only way? In our postmodern world, how can we lay claim? How can our young ones lay claim to that and make Jesus exciting? Something that is hip, if you, if you pardon the word. Pastor Edwin. Thank you for that question. Um, I think that's one of the challenge we have as uh, one of the challenges Christianity has in this postmodern world. In the sense that everybody believes that all we, all, all road leads to God. So how come we claim exclusive, exclusive view that Jesus Christ is the only way? Now, first, what my answer is this. He said it and he did something about it because he's the only one who went to the cross to die for the sins of mankind. He did something about it. But more importantly, if we look at that, people think good works will get you to God. No, it's not good work. The Bible makes us to understand that for by grace are we saved, not of works, let anyone should boast. It is the gift of God through Jesus Christ. And so when we come to say Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth and the life, it's making the point that God himself is the only way because it speaks to the deity of Jesus as well, that he's the only way to God because he is God. And you need to acknowledge that he is God. You need to acknowledge the work he did on the cross of Calvary. I think in Romans 10, he says, if you confess and believe that Jesus Christ died and on the third day he rose, hallelujah, and you believe that fact, you will be saved. And so is that understanding the works of Jesus, what he did, and what the Bible stated about the person of Jesus and his deity supports the fact that he is the only way. Now, no other leading, I would say, leading religious person claimed they are the only way to God. Muhammad didn't claim it, Buddha didn't claim it, but Jesus claimed it because of what he did on the cross. And the Bible supports that fact, and we believe that fact. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, uh, Pastor Edwin. And uh, a follow-on question back to yourself, Simon, uh, is this, and it's, again, it's from, from one of our young uh, listeners. And the question is this, how do I back up the fact that God is not just a figment of my imagination and not merely a coping mechanism for the stress and pain around me? How do our young ones uh, back up that fact, advertise, promote Christ uh, in such a way to make an impact uh, in the company of their friends and those they associate with. Great. Yeah. I, um, well, here's, here, there's, here's one thought. There's a, you can know that God's not a figment of your imagination if there's good reasons to believe that God's there. Um, if I, if I told you that I believe in a giant flying spaghetti monster that moves around out of space, um, or, or I believe in Santa Claus, you might think that these things are a figment of my imagination and ask me, how do I know that a flying spaghetti monster is not a figment of my imagination or that Santa Claus isn't? And, and, and I would be stuck because I would have no good reasons for believing in Santa Claus and no good reasons for believing in a flying spaghetti monster. I'd also be stuck because virtually no one, no adults in the world, I hope there's no young children listening to this call and discovering that Santa Claus is or Father Christmas is not really true, but 
no adults in the world believe in a flying spaghetti monster or Father Christmas. But when it comes to God, most people around the world today and most people throughout human history have believed that there's more to life than this physical world. So right there, you've got good reason to believe, hey, this I don't need to just conclude it's a figment of my imagination. Most people don't think that there's no God or no spiritual aspect to life. Are there any other reasons for believing that there's a God? Absolutely. Let me give you two or three, depending on time. Oh, we haven't got a lot of time. I'll, get, I'll give you two. Here's one. Uh, there are three possible explanations for the existence of the universe, right? That why is there something rather than nothing? It could have been there's nothing, but there's something. There's this universe. All right. Three possible explanations. Number one, um, it's always existed. The universe has just always been here. Number two, it popped into existence by itself. Pop. Number three, um, God brought the universe into existence. That's your only three options. It's always been here. It popped into existence by itself. It was brought into, in, into existence by God. All right. Well, are we interested in what science has to say? Yes. Science tells us that the universe had a beginning. It hasn't always been here. Okay. Well, if we're interested in what science has to say, that eliminates that option, leaving only two options. Either the universe popped into existence by itself or God brought it into existence. But science also tells us that nothing that exists exists without a cause. For example, um, the chair that you're sitting on had a cause. It's physical. Uh, trees have a cause. They're physical. You have a cause. You're physical. I'm not going to tell you your cause. You should know it by now, but if not, speak to your parents. Okay. So we everything that's physical has a cause. The universe is physical. It must also have had a cause. Well, if that's true, then that eliminates the second option that it just popped into existence by itself without a cause, leaving only one remaining option that God brought the universe into existence. Now, some people say, well, who created God? And the answer is, there's no reason that God need have been created because God is not physical. God, by definition, is spiritual. So in other words, there's no plausible explanation for the universe's existence, except the third one that God brought it into existence. I, and this, this cause must be, you know, highly intelligent, highly powerful, i.e. God. So that argument for God existence is known as the cosmological argument for God existence, God's existence. One more very good reason to believe that um, the universe, that there is a God, is the overwhelming impression of order and design in the universe. Let me finish with this example. If you were walking through a garden and you came across an encyclopedia lying on the ground, would you conclude that that encyclopedia got there by accident, that a nearby paper factory exploded and all the ink and the glue and the paper by chance conglomerated in the air and landed and formed that encyclopedia? No, you would not. Why? Because that encyclopedia has order, it has design, and the other third thing it has is information. And you, you rationally conclude intelligence behind that information. Look at, look at you, you as a human being, you have order, you have design, and within your very DNA, you have information. Scientists have only discovered this in the last few decades. You have semiotic information, language in your DNA, instruction book about how to create a human being. And, and intelligent information like that doesn't come from nowhere. There's always intelligence behind intelligent information. This is the very reason why the world's leading atheist, Anthony Flew, converted from being an atheist to a believer in God. One of the reasons was the evidence of uh, DNA research in just the last few decades. So there's just a few good reasons to believe in God, but more than just a philosophical idea, God is someone that you can know who loves you and who means that you're not here by accident. You're here on purpose because God wanted you to be here. He wants a relationship with you. And that's why he sent Jesus Christ in order to connect you back to him. You want to know God? Put your hand in the hand of Jesus Christ and trust him. And just like with science, you can test things exactly like Pastor Victor said, you can test it with God by talking to him and praying to him. And if you're someone who doesn't know God and you want to test to see if God's real, well, let me leave you with this challenge. Tonight, when you're alone in your room, pray this sincere prayer. God, if you're there, please reveal yourself to me. You have absolutely nothing to lose, but everything to gain because this God loves you and you can test you and he'll, he'll come through. So just try that one out.
Fantastic. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you, our panelists. We've run out of time, Pastor Victor, Pastor Edwin. Uh, and again, please, uh, your questions, please do uh, send them in still, because over the week, uh, this wonderful week that we've got the Why Jesus program running, we've got Monday, uh, we've got Wednesday, we've got Saturday as well. We will take time as well to, to still come back and, and answer some of those questions. So it's been a great uh, illumination of why Jesus is so relevant in our times. And we thank God for, for the time we've had. I'm just gonna hand over to Pastor Victor uh, for uh, the virtual altar call. Pastor Victor. Thank you very much, Elder John, uh, for, for that. And uh, for the panelists, thank you so much. Uh, for Simon and Pastor Edwin, you know, awesome, really awesome. And thank you for everyone that's watching uh, so far, and I hope that you have found it very useful, um, a, a session. Um, I just particularly want to just address, perhaps you've been on the on the call and on the session, and maybe you are, um, you know, you, you're thinking through what is being said. I hope that as you are thinking through it, you are an honest questioner. You've got an open mind about this. And if you are, then that's great, because that's all God asks of you at this time just an open mind an honest search for truth and if that is you then that's great that's a great place to start and i want to invite you uh, to uh, join in um, god has such a, a plan for your life um, god brings the message of christianity is a message of hope it's a message of love the god who loves you so much that he gave his only son to die for you so that you can your relationship to him can be restored to be the way it's meant to be you know the life on earth here is not the end at some point life on here on on this earth will end there is life beyond what you see right now and your only way to know not just the life now to live it in the way god has destined for you to live but also to be able to live beyond now eternally with god that only way is to put your faith in jesus don't wait until you are completely convinced by all of the claims of christianity you can't be totally convinced by everything at some point you'll need to walk the walk of faith this is the journey that millions of people have walked and they have found christ to be true to what he has said which is when he says, come to me, all ye who are weary, burdened, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's not talking about people who are tired. He's not talking about, he's talking about people who know that in them, there is this gap, this, gap, this hole, that is a God-shaped hole that only God can fill. Only a life in Jesus can fill that spiritual hunger that I know that you feel. That's why you're on the call. That's why you are participating. Why don't you give Jesus a chance right now? Come to him. Just say a prayer with me and you will know what we know, what I have known in my life and millions of other Christians know on this call and outside of this call that Jesus does indeed offer eternal life and he offers a life with purpose, a life that you will never be able to understand or, or comprehend outside of him. So pray this prayer with me now, if you if you can, and um, just say the words after me. It's a very simple prayer, and it just goes like this. Lord Jesus, I don't know, I'm not sure whether everything I have heard tonight is true, but I do know that you have invited me to come and test and see that you are true to your word. So I come to you now. I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to take me as your own and be the Lord and Savior of my life. From today, I want to live for you. Help me to live in accordance with your will and your purpose for my life, in Jesus' name. The Bible tells me that if you have prayed that prayer, that you have become a Christian, and I congratulate you, 
and I say well done I welcome you into the family of God please get in touch so that we can talk to you more about Jesus and about what he has for you you will find out all the information about how you can get in touch online and in a moment God bless you thank you I hand over now to the host Pastor. Thank you very much, Pastor Victor. Thank you very much, Simon. And thank you very much for everyone that has joined us on this platform, either through the various Zoom events, as well as our YouTube and um, Facebook link. Please take time out to complete the form. If you've got pertinent questions you want to ask, please complete the um, link in the YouTube or in your Zoom chats on contact me or if you have given your life, we would like to support you in this new journey of life. Please complete the, I want to know more about Jesus form. The link is in the YouTube chat. It's in your Zoom chat. And as you do that, we will support you. People will come alongside with you on this wonderful journey. Please just to let you know that we will continue with the Why Jesus event tomorrow at 7 p.m. Please join us. Um, if you have a Zoom, if you have been invited to a Zoom watch party, log into your Zoom party or your watch event at 6.45 p.m. And tomorrow's theme is very interesting. Jesus and humanity, what gives us worth. Please invite your friends, invite your colleagues. You feel that they need to hear this message. And so we will continue. And now I will hand over back to the various Zoom um, platforms who are having their Zoom watch parties. Lord, thank you for joining us on YouTube. Please stay online if you're watching on YouTube to complete the form. Thank you for coming and God bless you.